gentlemen, you are both drunk on cosmic wine. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Mark Sylvester. And I'm Dr. Richard Schulman. This, this is, is All Psych. Psych. Welcome to the next part of our series, The Non-Ordinary Mind. Today's show, I have it right here, is on spirits and phantasms. That's the title, really. But Rich, we're going to be talking about a lot of ghoulies, right? Just in time for Halloween, all kinds of ghoulish stuff, some historical perspectives, some existential perspectives. But most of all, what does this mean about consciousness and our ever expanding plight to turn on our viewers into thinking of higher consciousness and meaning and being and less so about terror and TV and pandemics and, and elections? Well, it certainly opens up a bigger world, Mark. You know, I mean, uh, cultures have talked about this as long as there've been culture. And um, it seems to be pretty popular in, uh, in modern pop culture, movies, TV, songs. Um, and we hear it in the trenches here in the, you know, the work that we do regarding emotional healing. So yeah, I think it's a really cool topic for uh, people to consider. And, and, you know, this is an educational topic because doing the research on the show, I learned a lot about different types of ghosts, uh, spirits, phantasms. Um, we got all kinds of names for these disembodied uh, souls, but they're more than just disembodied souls. A lot of them are symbols. A lot of them are, 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 are godlike. Uh, you know, if you're talking about an angel versus an archangel, um, or a, a ghost versus a specter, how do they differ? How about how about um, a deity versus a demigod? All of this, by the end of the show, you will know yourself. So, you want to open? How do you want to open this discussion? Well, for sure. Do you have a good ghost story or something? I got I got a ton of them, but the first thing I want I want to say is that. Um, there was a study done recently, 45% of Americans believe they've seen a ghost. And 55% uh, of couples after they've lost a spouse will report a visitation. Now, personally, I've got tons of ghost stories, but I just start with that my parents both came to me as, as they died to say goodbye. They died separately, I mean. But so I had that experience twice that they came to me to say goodbye. And it was actually very comforting. Now, the, the interesting part was that I didn't know, I knew they were of course ill. I didn't know they had actually died until a little while later when I got the phone call. So this, so my visitation, it could have been my emotional wish to see them because I knew they were sick. But um, it was interesting that I didn't know they were dead until later. So I've had that experience and I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen my grandparents. I talked to my, my dear friend and mentor, Arnold, uh, and my cousin who died at the World Trade Center. In fact, I wrote a song about that. And, and he was, he looked fabulous, by the way. He, he had all his hair back, you know, and, and he, uh, he looked young and beautiful and he had a golden glow around him. And that's a, there's a whole story around that. But I think most families have ghost stories. Yeah, most families and most uh, uh, cultures and most age, you know, this isn't just something that, you know, little Boy Scouts tell each other around the, the campfire to scare each other. Um, these are, some of these are quite veridical accounts caught on camera. They're unexplained. Um, you know, you've seen those videos on the internet where, a guy who looks exactly like himself, all, 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 we're gonna talk about a doppelganger, um, pushes his other self out of the way of being hit by a, a train or a truck um, or, or just someone disappearing right before they were about to be hit. Uh, there's a lot of stuff like that on the internet. It's a lot of apparitions, but I think it's good to get the nomenclature down. One, two, 
I, we had a ton of fun researching this because there's so much fascination about the cultures and the time period. And a lot of times the country, you know, like, like uh, there's a little historical stuff on Irish banshees that we're going to get into here. But I mean, I think, I think ghosts in the, in the colloquial proverbial sense um, are, are kind of equivalent to spirits or apparitions or phantasms. They all kind of have a similar meaning in that, you know, a ghost could be defined as, as a, as a human, as someone who once lived, but has since died. And then they're trapped in the, this limbo or this uh, bardo plane, if you want to talk about uh, a Hindu name for this space that they're more versed in describing. And, you know, they, they're unable to move on to the next front, the next step, the next uh, iteration, whatever it is that's the next uh, barrier. They get trapped there. And so they can roam the earth. Uh, they can appear to loved ones. Um, most people, I think the concept people have of a ghost is, is, is accurate. It's, it's kind of accurate. Apparitions, um, fan, uh, phantoms, ghosts. I would say the phantoms are a little bit different in that um, phantoms can actually be uh, a, not a person. They could be an irrational fear, um, something that doesn't exist but causes fear anyway, if you, if you will. A mysterious mo monster, you know, maybe a chupacabra is a, is a, is a phantom. Um, but ghost is a generic term for spirit or, or apparition. Um, so it's, you know, where a lot of the colloquial, Hey, when you give up the ghost, when you die, when you're releasing your soul. So it's a disembodied soul of, of someone who's previously lived being trapped in, in the afterlife, or at least the first stage of an afterlife, assuming it's many stages. And like you said, people see these everywhere and one of the things we got to figure out and what do we got 30 minutes to figure this out is why, why, and what does it mean? And that kind of thing. So I want, I want the listeners to really be thinking about that as we go through the different types of ghosts and apparitions and um, what, what's the thread that ties them all together. What's what could explain them all a, a, a unified theory, if you will. So well, who's, ready? To say what's ready? Real? who's to say what's real anyway? I had a patient who went on a camping trip over at Fort DeSoto and he says to me, did you know that place is haunted? And I said, no, I didn't know. He goes, well, let me show you. He pulls out a picture and there's something there. He says, yeah, I went to the park range. He said, oh, that's the lady, la, 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 la. He had a whole story. Yeah, everybody sees her. There was something in the picture. Could it have been lens flare? be a pretty weird lens for her to look like a person, but I guess it could be. He claims that he saw it, that his friend saw it, and uh, he took the picture. So there's, you know, there's, uh, there's more than just people wanting to see their loved ones, you know, yeah. and there's legends of this all over the place. Yeah, and I mean, what great, better place to start than with the Irish Banshee, oh, because I, love I just love saying Banshee. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, the reason why we came up with the name Spirits and Phantasms was because it sounded cool. Well, it, of course it sounds cool. Uh, you know, but, but this, this shows a lot more th than an, about just Spirits and Phantasms. It's about other types of uh, mythical creatures or uh, extracorporeal beings. We're going to go deep on this one. I'm, I'm pretty excited. So the Irish Banshee... Um, it is always a female spirit. Um, it, it stems out of Irish folklore. Um, you don't really want to see one. It's kind of like a, do a doppelganger that can be a harbinger of get death in, in that the Irish Banshee um, is kind of it heralds in the death of a family member. Um, and she does that by looking right at you and giving this bone chilling um, shrieking, wailing, keening sound that makes the hair stand up at the back. 
And I think it's her language for your loved one's about to die. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, but they're terrifying. And what's interesting is the word for Banshee, and I'm going from my memory here, um, has something to do with the name, the Irish English name of these, I don't know if they were ceremonial mounds, but they're they, these, these topographical landscapes in Ireland where you get these large mounds and they were thought to live in there. Uh, obviously that's some deep pagan, you know, pipe smoke and stuff going on there, but that's <laughs> where the term comes from. And that's where the legend uh, originated. So, I mean, Irish banshees are great. Um, I always feel like there's a little bit of a competition though, between the Irish and the Scottish though, don't you? The Scottish have banshees too? The Scottish have the wraiths. Oh, it's the wraiths against the banshees. Yes. Kind of like in Star Trek with the paw wraiths. That's right. The That's fire right. spirits. But no, so, you know, Scottish wraiths, um, it's an old English word, wraith. Um, it literally means something that has been twisted. Uh, it's a spirit that has been twisted or deformed by evil. Um, I didn't watch Lord of the Rings, but apparently this is a perfect example. I, mean, I, I knew the paw wraiths from Star Trek, but in Lord of the Rings, there was a uh, Nazgul, who is, is like a, a wraith, is the closest thing to a wraith. Um, now, in Star Trek, they had, remember they had the good wraiths and then the, the fire wraiths, the paw it, wraiths. And uh, the Stargate Atlantis had wraith, wraiths, yeah. too. Yeah. So, again, a type of a manifestation of consciousness, a type of, a, of maybe folklore, maybe evidence of a, some unique type of, of deity or, or demigod. This um, stuff shows up in a lot of places. Do, do you have a thought about why? Why they show up in lots of places? Yeah, it seems to be across the board. Um, you know, just about every culture has them. I mean, it's got to serve some. I think, you know, we see such, if you just think of the electromagnetic spectrum, we see our eyes, our senses measure such a tiny fraction. Like if you look at this massive electromagnetic spectrum, it's like someone took a razor blade and slit right through the middle, the width of, of, of electromagnetic frequencies that humans are capable of picking up on consciously. Um, it, boy, it kind of reminds me of the end of uh, Cosmos when uh, Jodie Foster's character says, you know, if we are alone in the universe, it seems like an awful waste of space. You know, there, there is an awful amount of information there. We know it's there because we can measure it through other means. And I think that's what got people excited and ghost hunting and stuff like that is, well, let me get tools, extensions of myself to be able to pick up on, on things I can't personally, like the EMF meters and, and voice recorders or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think that that's, if that's a common core experience, it would explain why it shows up in all time periods and all cultures, but the interpretation can certainly be different. Well, what, what, I, what I experienced um, when I saw my cousin who died at the World Trade Center was uh, his wish was that I tell his mother, my aunt, that he was okay and that she could give up her grief and that he couldn't get through because the grief was too high. So when I told her, you know, what I had experienced, she started to laugh. And I said, what are, you, what are you laughing about? And she said, oh, you think you're the first one to tell me this? He's come to everyone in the family with the exact same message. I thought that was pretty remarkable, actually. You know, yeah. that, uh, except for her and his father, of course, who were, who were in a higher stage of grief than the rest of the family. And the message was, I'm okay. In fact, he even said that he, by the way, he had all his hair back. He looked terrific. <laughs> um, and he said to me, you know, please tell my mother I'm all right. That was his wish. Do me a favor. Tell her I'm all right. You can see that I'm fine and let her know I'm all right and she can give up her grieving. Now imagine that we weren't afraid of death. In this culture, we're pretty afraid of death. I think it would change a few things. Not that we shouldn't live, but we live without the fear that we're going to die. I think it'd be a very different culture if we did. And that's the culture we're trying to change. And the reason we're trying to change it now is because 2020 
has been an unusual year for the record books. We have got to make good come out of this. We've got to learn from this. We've got to evolve humanity and consciousness and our species, and we've got to provide healing. And Dr. Shulman and I, I speak for him as well, strongly believe that this is the time and now more than ever, people really need to be looking inward and focusing on these things and less so on the fear and the body count and the death and the dismemberment. You'll be excited to know, Rich, I figured out how to share the screen. So watch Ooh. this. Hang on, to your, hang on to your hats. I'm, I'm about to show us an Irish banshee. Uh, what happened? Do you see it? Do you see it? There she there, is. There you go. Wow. There she is. Oh, wow. Wow. Woo. That one scared me. <laughs> well, you, you ran away really fast. I guess we're okay. Yeah, but... Uh, that's a good picture of, a, of an Irish banshee. You know, it's funny because we tend to think of these things as scary. You know, if you think of a ghost as a disembodied spirit of a human being, it shouldn't be that scary. But, um, you know, we, we talk to human spirits in bodies all day long, you know. And, yep. um, but somehow if it's not in a body, all of a sudden it gets scary. So, yeah, I, I mean... Uh, it, it, it pushes on our, our own fears, I guess, which it shouldn't. It should be the reverse. Yeah, if anything, they're less worried about corporeal stuff and they probably- Well, just the, I, no, but the idea, I mean, my, my son asked me once, he said, uh, Dad, you, you write a lot of songs about death. Why do you write songs about death? I said, I don't write songs about death. I don't believe in death. I write songs about the afterlife. You know, oh, you know he gave me one of those. But I really don't believe in death. I believe in transformation. And the, this topic fits that idea that nothing is really created or destroyed. It's just transformed. Yeah. And, you know, these, these um, ghosts, these spirits, these phantasms who appear across culture. Now, is that another banshee? This is a wraith. So this is a Scottish wraith. Okay. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. I don't know if it'll fit. The um, <laughs> the it, I find it I find it really fascinating that uh, while this show will be out in a, a little bit afterwards, we're right coming up on Halloween when this is you know it becomes a little bit of a bigger deal. Now originally, what what I understand is that the reason for that is that this is supposed to be the time of year that the veil between the worlds is the thinnest and you can go visit your That's relatives. Right. And, and there's the, the, the legends of people riding broomsticks and you know ghosts and goblins showing up in uh, odd places and where the candy thing comes from, I don't know, but it's probably some kind of pagan ritual as most things in our culture are when you just scratch the surface, so go figure. All right, I got, I got a good one for you. You'll, you'll like this one. Sure. Um, let's see here. Um, this is a incubus, not to be confused with the band. All okay. right. Now, what is an incubus? I'm glad that you ask. My wife free, uh, frequently calls me an incubus, and you will chuckle once you hear my definition. And an incubus is a male demon believed to have sexual intercourse with sleeping women. Okay. I think that means my wife doesn't like to be messed with in her sleep. Or she just thinks it's a cool sounding name. I'm going to go with that. Let's I hope so. Cool. Let's go with the cool. I hope so. Name. Or she thinks I'm a demon. That's that's possible too. I don't know. We'll have to have her on the show. Things can have more than one meaning, we've found. <laughs> Sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, you know. That's true also. But incubuses, there have been, I mean, I call them veridical, but anecdotal um, accounts and lots of them of ghosts, ra ghost rapes. Um, it's, I, I, I didn't do dive deep into it, but that would be more likely to be an incubus um as opposed to a succubus right this is a different type of creature what's what's a succubus let's see 
I'm going to pop quizzy on this one. The succubus is essentially it's the reverse. It's the reverse. It's the female uh, a form um, of it. Let's see. Will YouTube allow me to put this succubus on here? I don't know. I don't know, but we're going to do it anyway. What do you think? Just an adventure, Mark Sylvester. Yeah, it's like seems like I had a pretty good incubus picture up here. I mean, succubus. So now we're on the succubus and there she is. She's fully clothed, but let's say she's a little de demon dame. Um, she's quite the looker, quite the looker. But a succubus is really a demon or another supernatural entity in folklore, always female form, unlike the incubus. Um, tends to appear in dreams. Now she's there to do one thing and one thing only. You can see that little pagan star on her left hand. She's there to seduce men through sexual activity. Matter of fact, legend has she's irresistible. Um, she, she seduces and enchants uh, all men and, and is more powerful than all of them. And according to religious traditions, repeated sexual activity with a succubus can cause poor physical and mental health, even death. Who knew? Not me. I mean, that's good stuff, right? You heard it here first, folks. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting, Mark, is all I can tell you. Um... I, I, got, I got a lot of ghost stories that come up when I hear about some of these, but... Uh... You know, sometimes they, they call the Irish banshee a lady in white. And uh, am I allowed to say my, one of my brothers will just say that, saw a lady in white one time. And it, well, boy, it freaked him out. Well, you know, as uh, Shakespeare talks about ghosts, and, you know, and also there's a lot more in heaven and earth than has been explained by our science. I was uh, with my ex and we were, driving to meet a friend of mine and it was just this really crazy situation I couldn't get in touch with him we're driving he was in from California visiting in Fort Myers we got I couldn't get in touch with him we got outside of Fort Myers and there was a wreck that had happened maybe 30 seconds before we got there we pulled over the guy was lying you know dying and and my ex said she went into this trance state. She, she like eyes rolled back in her head. And I said, what happened? And she said, well, I had to talk to his spirit and let him know he was dead. I think that's why we're here. Turned out my friend wasn't even there. He didn't come in till the next day. And I, I always thought that we were brought to that place so that she could help this spirit cross over. She said he was confused. He didn't know he was dead. He was walking around. And she was in La Laville and then came out of it and she was fine. So who knows with these things? They're, they're wild cards. And while, while we may wish to see loved ones, I know I saw both my parents uh, as they died, as I mentioned, and I've seen my, my closest adult friend. Um, It's hard to know what's real with this, except that it affects people emotionally. Right. You know, it was very powerful for me to see my cousin and I was not thinking about him. Obviously, you know, somebody who died at the World Trade Center, that was a big deal. It wasn't like I was thinking about him. And then all of a sudden there it was. And, you know, these, these things can happen in dreams they can happen in daydreams. They can happen. People report it just kind of hanging out, you know, that they'll see something. Animals too. Yep. Um, my my friend Arnold, the, the the one who came to me while he was in human form, he had a dog, and he said, "Oh, I see her around the house all the time after she died." So, um, and they're comforted by it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I loved it that I that I got to see my parents because they looked like they were okay. I especially love seeing my cousin and having him tell me that he was okay and to bring the message to my aunt. Um, I don't, from my point of view, okay, 
I don't know why anybody would really believe my story. It's a good story. From my point of view, it's as real as real can be. And I think that's most people's experience. So oh, that's a nice story. But when it happens to you, it's not a ghost story anymore. Yeah, it's something that you're forced to integrate into your understanding of your place in the world and your understanding of of the afterlife and the meaning. It, it challenges your mortality. There's a lot of layers to it where I think people, it's much easier just to sort of brush it off or, well, or not we, want to know we, about it. Well, we live, we live in a time of materialism, you know, especially scientific materialism. We can't measure this thing, then it doesn't exist, no matter that there's thousands of years of people talking about this. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are a lot, I think a lot depends on how you label it with certain groups. If you say, well, you have a guardian angel, that's okay. If you have a spirit guide, well, all of a sudden you're in, a, in the dark land. So it's part of, it's part of, I think what Jung would call an archetype, the archetype of the angel. And it's part of our psychological development, I think, to experience these things. Once again, it begs the question of what's real, what isn't. To me, it's real. Well, fact. to me, it's a fact. Yeah. And I mean, I think a ghoul or a phantom or a specter. Um, I mean, I think for our purposes today, we can think of them as disembodied spirits, kind of analogous to apparitions, uh, ghosts. But again, remember, phantasm may or may not be uh, a, a ghost like a thing it could be an irrational fear but um these are these are images and that you see come up and I have some great photos but um i want to get to like some of the more uh unique i guess and conscious relevant types of thing and see what you think of these like the everyone's heard of a doppelganger what bothers me about the doppelganger is it's evolved to mean your 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 twin somewhere. Yeah. So if you have you have a look alike that's not related to you, they're your copy or your doppelganger. That's not what a doppelganger is. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a German word, I think. It might actually be older. It might be Danish or something. Um, how would they say that? Doppelganger. 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 Um, but you don't want to meet this character because that character is you. And if you see you, it's a harbinger of death, like we said before. So it's usually often portrayed as like a ghostly paranormal phenomenon. You see yourself and, and you know bad luck is to come. Usually your own death, but it could be um, misfortune of some other uh, form. Um, other traditions associate it with the evil twin, so as, as and like Stephen King wrote a book, The Dark Half, where he had an evil twin within himself. Um, but, it, you know, again, it evolved to me I mean, this twin stranger thing, you know, which which is kind of unfortunate because it loses the whole gestalt of what a doppelganger was um, and how terrifying it would be to bump into yourself, especially if you had a sense, wow this guy's going to replace me or this means mm -hmm. it's curtains for me or I'm going to be giving up the ghost or taking the dirt nap myself here soon. I imagine you wouldn't sleep very well for the forecoming future. Could be. You know, That's I, a fun, you, that's you a fun reminded one. me of, of, a, of another story from my friend Arnold who, who did come to me after he died. He told me the story while he was alive that um, in Vietnam, he was a Navy SEAL and he, um, he was in this village and he protected the chief's daughter and then they were on a mission and, and the village was massacred. Years later, he was on a mission and he said the chief's daughter um, appeared to him and said, don't go down this road, they're waiting for you, go around the other way. Yeah. And he said it was exactly the way she had described and she saved his life. Well, and here's here's an image of a doppelganger meeting themselves, um, and apparently is fainting. And of course, these characters back here are going, "What the hell?" 
that image was brought to us by the courtesy of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, how they met themselves. Mm-hmm. It's a watercolor from 1864. So these have been around a long time. It's a, it's a, you know, you, you, you can see people, meet people, hear about people that have met their doppelgangers. And they're usually met with um, untimely bad fortune. Mm-hmm. Um, now we're getting into some, some of the, some of the, some of the dark arts here. Some of these are a little bit more mythical. We're not going to talk about werewolves and chupacabras. Cause to me, that's not as much along the spirits and phantasms. They're more corporeal. Yeah. They're more corporeal, uh, vampire. Hmm, what do you think? What do you think about vampires? Um, I've met a lot of energy vampires, but, um, uh, the legends are that they that they materialize. You know, the the vampires they're actually become material. Some of these others they're that, material, but they're undead. Correct. Right. Whatever. Right. Whatever that means. I mean, I don't like know. a zombie. Right. They cannot be killed. Met a few of those too. Um, I'm looking over the list that that you uh, came up with, and it's uh, there's some things that you know, some mischievous spirits like uh, imps. Uh, oh yeah, you want to you want to talk about some imps? Imps, elves, gin. Gin actually uh, can be negative, I thought. Oh yeah. Yeah, they they're uh, mischievous spirits. Uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can sh- This is this is what I got for vampire, by the way. And if th- if this was a vampire, it wouldn't be all that bad. I don't know if he's the vampire or she's the vampire, but <laughs> I was about to say it depends. She's Elvira. It depends which one you are. It looks like she's uh, she's got the upper hand there. Yeah. Well, she's probably the uh, the 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 Elvira, the vampiris, the vampiris. But of course, we know vampires. They're they're kind of as Halloween. We like to drink blood to. I guess maintain their lack of life. I don't really know totally how that how that works. Um, so you want to talk about um, well, there, there's some nasty stuff like demons, which some some would describe as fallen angels. The whole angel versus archangel um, topic we talked about before the show. I think most people know of as, as angel is a departed um spirit that agrees to stay in an afterlife or maybe that's what you become when you get to whatever heaven like uh you know stovacor or valhalla or or the or the christian heaven or uh i don't i'm sure there's a lot of good heavens out there um but you an archangel never was a human that's the big difference right these, these were angels sent by a, a supreme being to help kind of be the teacher of angels who had formerly been humans. So there's kind of like a military hierarchy thing going on there <laughs> I find fascinating. Uh, similar to like deities and demigods, you know, a deity really is any supernatural be- being um, that's considered, you know, powerful. Um, in, well, in, I, in its own right, whereas a demigod is like a half god, half human. It's the offspring of a god and a human. They can be mortal, unlike unlike an angel or an archangel, um, but they can also be an Im- immortal. I call them like deity lights. They're half gods. Um, I, had a, I had a patient who claimed that she had a demon with her, and um, it was real interesting because I, I had to learn how to extract it, you know, and I, it was kind of hard. I finally found a, a preacher somewhere in the hills in California who, who taught me how to do it. And it was a fascinating experience. A couple of years later, she called me up. You know, I wasn't seeing her anymore. And she called me up and she said, remember when we did that thing with the demon? She says, do you think that it was an actual demon or did I just take all the anger that I had and put a face on? I said, well, that's a pretty good question. And I don't know the answer, but if you asked me to bet based on my experience, I would have said it was a demon. I will tell you a lot of times during 
acute psychotic episodes like on uh, psych wards and stuff like that, one of the more common visual hallucinations, and again, to me, this can be very easily explained by dysfunction and and the brain itself and the neurobiology or the neurophysiology or specifically the parietal lobe, spatial temporal stuff is a lot of people will see faces, demonic faces coming out of the wall, which is kind of interesting. um, Because we, we just don't know if they're looking into another world because, you know, their brains are tuned differently or they're just taking, uh, you know, random lines and dots and creating a face out of it. There's no way to really know. Um, so I got a, go I got a, I got an image for a gin here. Okay. You ready for this one? You bet. Um, how do I make this sucker big? All right, that's about the best I can do. A gin is all, uh, is actually as a Romanized, you know, the gin came from the uh, uh, gin with a D, D G I N N. That's the anglicized version, which we call genies. But the there's like some ancient French or something that calls them Ginevre. Uh, they're all the same thing. It's a mischievous spirit. She's um, She's kind of like a monkey's paw, but I can't say monkey's paw anymore because no one knows what a monkey's paw is. Somebody freaking look it up. Monkey's paw is like the opposite of a rabbit's foot. And that's what genies do. They give you these wishes and they always come at a cost greater than what you're seeking. Um, And so, yeah, if a genie pops out of the bottle, give me the three wishes, what do you want? Well, I want my first wish is I want a million wishes. No, you can't do that. That one's out of bounds. Um, or, you know, I want to be well known. Well, then you get hit by a bus and you're in the newspaper or you're well known. And no matter what you do, the mischievous little spirit has always got an ulterior motive, kind of like in Bedazzled. Good movie. Brandon mm-hmm. Fraser and uh, what's her face? Super good looking British woman. Oh, Elizabeth Hurley. Thank you. Great. She, she should have been a gin. Now she said she was the devil. I'd say she was more like a gin in there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they come at a price. And, uh, did you see the X-Files episode, um, with the genie when they found her in the yeah. storage unit and unrolled her out of the carpet? And yeah. what finally broke the spell is Mulder asked, um, Mulder granted her wish to become human because she was tired of living thousands and thousands of years mm-hmm. and it broke and it broke the mischievous spell. Um, so altruism, active altruism is the kryptonite to the gin. Should you, uh, cross one of them? Um, oh, I didn't get my, here's my picture of the gin. This will be good. I don't know what she's doing there. She's just smoking. She's smoking. That's for sure. She can, that she can appear and, and disappear. Oops. And wisps of smoke. Um, unlike oh. an imp. Were you, were you talking about imps? Well, you know, it, there's, um, I read a book about a place in, in, I think it is, I don't know if it's Ireland or Scotland now, I get called Findhorn. Mm. And the idea is that you can talk to the, to the sprites and the divas and the imps there, and they, they'll grow food for you. They'll help yeah. you grow things. The little purple people. Something like that. And, and, um, I have known people who will talk to the other side, who will talk to these divas and sprites and the, the spirits of different plants, um, as well as people who talk to spirits on the other side. You know, there's lots of movies about this, but I've also experienced this where there have been a reader who said, well, there's an older woman here who cares about you a lot and then we'll you know, her name is, I remember this, her name is Claire, Clara. My grandmother was Clara. And I, I remember going, wonder where she found that out. But you know what? There was, it's a very low probability event. Yeah. And I like, I like the fairies and the imps. They, they seem smaller. I don't know, in physical size or yeah. emotional complexity, they're more playful. 
Sure. Um, they tend to live among nature, you know, like the imp is European, I th I'm pretty sure, um, it, but it's similar. It's a European fairy slash demon, um, but it's described tons in their folklore and their superstition. Um, the name imp derives from uh, another term, Y-M-P-E, which is actually used to denote a young grafted tree. So it's almost like a sprite or something growing out of matter out of the forest, which I, I think is pretty poetic, um, as opposed to like an oni in Japanese folklore, which is a demon, ogre, or troll, typically portrayed as these like hulking. Actually, I got a picture of one of them, but first first let me show you my my picture of, a, of an imp. She's really cute. Is, is, is a he? I tend to think of these as the imps uh, on the tail. Mm -hmm. um, but you see how they're kind of jokey, jestery, you know, with the cards and <laughs> fiddling around back here. They're just little playful things that can, I guess, then steal your spirit and banish it to a missing dimension. Uh, the Japanese, boy, they love their horror movies. They love folklore. They love demons, ghosts, spirits. They got the Oni, which uh, they're these, yeah, they're these crazy hulking uh, creatures that uh, have horns. They got horns like a devil. Um, they're usually conceived of as red, blue, or white colored, uh, wearing loincloths and tiger's pelt and carrying these iron uh, kanabo clubs which I'm gonna find a picture of one of them suckers right now because they're pretty cool. Have you heard of these fellas? No, no, I never heard of them. I know the Japanese have a lot of uh, legends about uh, spirits from the other side. I never knew what they were called. You'll recognize them because they're depicted on many of their temples. Um, like, let me see if this is a good example of one. Uh, not the best picture, but this will jog your memory. Mm -hmm. They tend to have, you know, cloven hooves and then horns and and teeth, and they carry along these these clubs. I had a better picture, but I didn't put them all together here to get in time. So there's 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 certainly a fascination out there with these things. There's a, people and the, the cultural interpretations are one thing. But what, 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 to your point before, what are they? What are we seeing? Are these, are these telepathic projections? Was it your desire to see your, your, a loved lost, you know, recently so much so that you project that mentally, telepathically, outright hallucination? Um, you know, the, you talked about, I think you talked about the movie Contact earlier and she she uh, talks to the preacher and she says that she wants proof, you know, yeah. that, that God exists. And he says, "Do you did you love your father?" Yeah. And she says yes. And he says, "Prove it." Okay. There are some things that you know that that are much harder to to measure, and um, I guess that's why we use the word faith on some of these things. And and I would say the the underwriting idea about all this is um <laughs> that's pretty cool there's your owning there you go that if there's a bigger world that we might not take we might take this world both more seriously and less seriously we seem to become very rigid in this world and you know if if you get a visit from your cousin who tells you stuff or your friends or whatever mm -hmm. who you think you've lost it will change things um we want to expand consciousness into a bigger world or help people to expand consciousness into a world where where love is as pete townsend once said where love falls from the trees you know and the idea that um we can look in these areas when, when our ordinary senses uh, are not picking up. Although people will say it was, it was really odd in that room and the dog and the cat would be right. in there. Or, um, so 
maybe I'm just really loosely wrapped. For me, it's real. I don't know. Well, and for me, I'd like to understand the mechanism. And to me, the mechanism requires connecting their world, if you will, with our world. And there are a number of ways that you could do that. I mean, it's one thing if you see a departed loved one, we could write that off. It's another if you have objective, objective instruments and EVPs, that's a different level of, of evidence. Um, but just conceptually, there's a lot of things that really get you thinking. Like we live in a three-dimensional space. If a three-dimensional object like a ball passed through a two-dimensional plane, all's the two-dimensional, you know, uh, world would see is a circle. They're not going to see a sphere. So is it possible we're dealing with either extra dimensional beings or more importantly, interdimensional beings that pass through briefly and under a set of circumstances, three-dimensional space and appear to us as an apparition because that's the shadow of a fourth dimensional being. Um, those are things that can be investigated. And I think, you know, are in some circles, maybe through physics, and but not really through like ghost hunting per se. And more importantly, how is it that you can get a psychic that walks out to Gettysburg, the battlefield, and they can tell you what happened there? What was it about the physical manifestation that imprinted the non-physical world? What and are they connecting to? What's that memory? Go the other way. I had a patient who had a phobia about going into movie theaters because of the red carpet in there. When we uh, did the work, she found herself at Gettysburg with blood in a hospital with blood everywhere. When she processed this, uh, next week she went to the movies, she didn't have a problem. That's uh, to me a heck of a coincidence if it was a coincidence. Yeah, but it's a therapeutic uh, success either way. You know, if you can oh, yeah, yeah. take the fangs out and um, get people to stop having whatever a ghost or a demon is attached to them, um, that's the end goal. Um, the other thing I think about is ectoplasm. So if spirits interact with our realm, they can sometimes leave ectoplasm. People, even people don't talk much about ectoplasm, but if you think about what it, you know, theoretically is and what it represents, it's a big deal because it's it's the it's the product. It's actually the end physical product of the transition from one world to another through that thinning of the veils, like you were speaking of before. Like in Haven, everyone watch Haven, great show. I'm not gonna spoil it, but they talk about thinnies in there in, in, the, in the veil between two worlds. One of my faves, it's okay. on Netflix. Um, these are the things where I, the questions that really kind of drive me, because if we understood the mechanism, we could interpret you know, the imps and the onis and the gins and the incubis and the succubis. And we ran out of time for boogeymen and uh, ogres and trolls and kitsunes and yukais, but uh, there's a lot you could go down forever. Uh, to me, that question is, is it real? What does it mean to you? How does it affect you? Like we were talking about ego dystonic versus syntonic. Is this, is this comforting to know that your loved one is still with you? Or is this horrifying because a demon is trying to command you to simulate? There's a different outcome. There's a different psychological set of stressors or, or potentially healing um, factors in how you interpret it. Because I tend not to think, oh, all disembodied spirits should terrify me anything i'm i'm a little bit more intrigued i'm not so intrigued that i want that's to go it. out and buy that's a ouija board and summon it but it's about embracing the mystery now you know in human life there's good people and not so good people okay or you know you could look at them as wounded people but why wouldn't you find the same thing on the other side you know i mean so to me exactly it's just an, as above so below you know and and I, from my point of view, I, I take a different tack, which is probably why we're good partners. I like embracing the mystery rather than figuring it out. I'll just, I'll just embrace it and say, okay, well, here's, here's this great mystery. 
it seems to have a big effect on people that I care about. In fact, um, I, rem I think I was prepped for this as a kid because we'd go out of the house and we'd come back and all the lights would be on in the attic and, and my father would immediately go, uh, oh, that's just your grandmother saying hello to us. You know, so it be it was kind of a normal thing, you know, that, that, and I don't know if he was kidding or not, but I didn't take it as kidding. Right. So these and other mysteries, do we have some mysteries upcoming there? We do. So um, next week, we are going to be talking about astral projection and remote viewing. Ooh, very cool. Which is pretty cool because I think it takes this a step further. Like we're, we're trying to figure out what all this is. There's ghosts and goblins and gins and all of this. And what are they real? What do we see? Why do we see it? Let's take it a, a step thir further next week and figure out, oh, hell with that. Let's just go do it. Let's uh, do it. And that's what astral projection is. It's taking you and punting you out of your body to remote view, travel, uh, do all kinds of stuff. Cool. Cool stuff. I don't want to I don't want to give too much of a spoiler alert here. Well, so. you, no, I didn't want to give you too much there either. So, um, that was a lot of fun talking about uh, spirits and fantastic. Yeah, I feel like a Boy Scout sitting around the campfire, you know, telling ghost stories. But well, I've lived this, so uh, you know, it to me, it's just it's just a bigger reality. So we will see you all next week. I hope everyone out there will tune in for the uh, astral projection and um, remote viewing show. Yeah. And uh, don't remote view it; it's easier to watch right on your. Uh, no, we're gonna do remote viewing. <laughs> so everyone i, I was getting are ready, ready? To <laughs> are you ready well are you going to show another picture i was totally not ready i was oh. going to show an astral projection picture oh, and i blew it i blew what? it i blew what? it it's gone save it's it for gone. next week all right so until then be well, be well. Ooh, we think we got what it if you point. said what if you said be well right when the finger hits you always do this fake out finger and then I'm like, be well, and then you fake go out finger, you know, that's, I think that's a punk band. All right. Our work is done here. All right. <laughs>